So, it's a new year, 2022. I know we actually get to this point in, in society that we actually make it to 2022 after the last two years have been such turmoil and, and just up, upheaval in every section of, of our society. But it's cool because everyone goes into the new year full of hope and promise and is, everyone's hyped up for what could be in the next chapter, the next new year, the next big thing that could happen. And I have to admit that I, I too, used to get so wrapped up in the anticipation that's in the new year. I mean, it's just, it, it, it builds and builds and builds, you know, from Christmas, that week, from Christmas to New Year's, I don't know, there's just a, a buildup of anticipation that seems to, to rise up within everyone in that week to see what it, what could be, what might be. But however, however, a couple of years ago, we started doing something different. As a family, we started doing something different. Instead of making resolutions, which everyone makes, I mean, but let's be honest, by the end of January, 95% of them were broken. We began to write down, both individually and as a family, our New Year's vision. Uh, we get we get into prayer, and we really find what it is that God has for us, or we feel that God has for us in the New Year. We we choose things maybe in our in our personal walk or as a corporate body that we want to see be better in the upcoming year. See God show up in mighty ways. This year, we actually sat down as a family to write our statements together over dinner. We sat down, we write, grab, brought a pencil and paper, and then we had the opportunity to share. We you know, gave ourselves a little bit of time because we'd all been talking about it and praying about it and seeking the Lord in it. And we gave each other the opportunity to share. Some chose to share, some did not. That's okay because your vision is your vision. And then what we did, we actually folded them, we placed them in our Bible under Habakkuk 2 2. That's where mine is actually right now. And we prayed over it. Because in Habakkuk 2 2, it tells us to write, write your vision on the tablet. Right? That's what we don't use tablets and chisels and stones anymore. We use paper and pencil. Thank God for that. So we, we wrote it, and we're standing on that. We're believing in that. And actually, Mel pulled out our vision from last year, and actually, a better part of it came to pass. We. we, we we sought out. Yes, there's still things that we that didn't that work. That, yeah, they're in the works that haven't manifested yet. But we're 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 still believing and still confident that it is going to happen. You see, we don't do this because we're trying to wish our way into the things God has for our lives or our family. We do it because we have hope. You see, hope's a powerful, glorious, merciful, loving God that wants nothing. But splendor and mag magnificence for his faith. That's what he wants. That's what he, uh, his expectation is for us, as long as we're walking in the law. Did you want to more? Yeah. A few weeks ago, Pastor Mel and I were sitting down, and we were getting ready for church like we do every other week. We, actually, I was sitting on the bed, and she was standing up, she put earrings in or something, or doing her hair, something. And we had a conversation just, just like every other day, and then just Something changed, something flipped in that conversation. And you could really feel the spirit start to move in between the two of us because we were talking of things of, in, of, about the word. And, and what if we were, we had been earnestly seeking a vision for the church for this upcoming, well, this year now. It was the upcoming year, but for this year. And we got it. It was very exciting. It was, the moment, it was at this moment that we jointly received the word for this ministry. For 2022. And that vision, it's more of a tag on it. It's hope over hype. And that's our title today as we start off, as we start off our year with our inaugural sermon for 2022. Our first is it'll be our first full year in ministry. Um, our scripture reading today is from Matthew 5, 25 through 34. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. And if anybody who's ever read this portion you'll or this section glad we don't know it. It says, a woman had had a hemorrhage for 12 years, and had endured much at the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Verse 27, after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus perceived in him himself that... 
that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Verse 31. And his disciples said to him, You see, the crowd is pressing in all around you. And you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. I want to talk to you today about the desire for something more. I want to talk about anticipating better things in the future and expecting your life to get better. And I want to warn you about believing the hype. Anyone who's ever heard of this story is well aware of the outcome and what it all means. I mean, it's been studied and studied and studied and studied and preached and preached and preached. It's a, it's a beautiful message, and no matter how many times you read it, no matter how many times you study it, no matter how many times you look at it, you find a new nugget every single time. And there's so much in this just amazing miracle that, that, that Christ has done for this, this woman. So we're going to break this down in a couple of ways. So first, I want to talk about the woman. If you notice, nowhere in the passages, nowhere in any of the Gospels, nowhere in any texts that I've ever found has this woman been given a name. She's a nameless woman. She's just known as the woman with the issue of blood. Could you imagine all eternity, your name to be known for history as I'm the woman with the issue of blood? I want to meet her when we get to I want to know what her real name is. Who knows? So the picture we can paint of this woman is this. Just picture in your mind. She's suffering. This woman is miserable. She's miserable in her own skin. She's been bleeding for 12 years. We don't know what she was bleeding from, but we kind of put two and two together, and it's, it is what it is. She was poor. She was broke. This woman had spent every last dime she had to seek the traditional treatment from physicians. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? In the, and we can we actually in the Jewish Talmud, which is a collection of the, the laws that governed all things and tells of the treatments and medicines that she would have received, and they were rather they were fantastic. It wasn't like you know they were giving her you know flowers and telling her to smell flowers and stuff. I mean they were the treatments they were doing they were costly and they were painful. And actually, even after the treatments, she was left worse off than before she went in. She was in a hopeless situation. Can any one of us identify with her? I think at some point in our lives we can. Maybe you're hopeless about a medical condition. I ran into a friend today, a dear friend, and he informed me it was raining at the dump this morning. I'd gone to dump a whole truckload of trash, and he told me, he said, Hey, where have you been? I said, Well, I've been here, there, where I work in ministry, in the firehouse, a little bit of everything. I said, How have you been? Well, I just found I have stage three or five, three or five throat cancer. Wow. And he's lovely. He was just like me bopping along. I was like, well, I don't know. I, I would like to think that I would have the same reaction, but I mean, I asked him, I said, can they operate? And he said, no. He said he thinks they're just going to give me medicine to kind of help slow it down. Wow. Wow. Maybe it's a relationship that you feel hopeless about. Maybe your job, your bills, your finances. It could be any numerous things. Maybe it's about your family. Maybe there are hopeless people in our family or hopeless situations in our family. Maybe some people are just hopeless about life. But see, this isn't the story, end of the story for this woman, for her or for you. Let's keep moving on. Let's keep, let's keep talking about, about the crowd now. Now, the second part of this is the crowd. The crowd is mentioned in this, in this text five times. So if it's mentioned five times, there must be something critical behind it, right? You would think that if, you know, you have a, tell somebody, uh, I mean, when it took me two minutes to read that, if you mention the crowd five times, then it's got to be significant. Now, I want you all to imagine this with me. Just, just put yourself back, you know, 2,000 years ago. Jesus is walking through the town, okay? It's like a famous person. Okay? You guys have seen pictures and videos, and maybe you've been experienced where you've seen a famous person. And there's a countless number of people trying to get a glimpse of this man who's called Christ, our Redeemer. Everyone's pushing and shoving just to jockey into position at a chance to 
to see him. The crowd, he tells us that the crowd is crushing in. I mean, that's what the disciples tell Christ, right? And they, the thing is, they are part of this crowd, right? So the disciples are part of this crowd. But the crowd was an issue for this woman. According to the law, because of her issue, she was probably shunned and she was now cast because she was considered unclean. Because she had a medical condition where she was bleeding, she was considered unclean. And nobody was actually to touch her or to associate with her because that would make them too unclean. So she's much like a leper, just a different situation, right? So she was shunned out of society. She's probably an afterthought in everybody's mind. Nobody thought much about her. Nobody thought, oh, well, here she comes. Everybody just get out of the way and let her get up there. No, they didn't care. And they probably would have looked down upon her. As I said before, the crowd was made up not only of the townspeople, but of the disciples as well. See, they were all, and I stress, all of them were standing in the way of this woman trying to get to Jesus. Let's put it into context. There are hopeless people all around us every day. Madeline, I'm sure you hear some of them on the phone and dispatch. We see them in our workplaces. We see them in the store. You can see them wherever you look. Maybe there's some sitting here right now. I bet there are those who wouldn't step foot in a place in, in this place or any other ministry because of fear. You see, they've been they've been and tried this whole thing called church before. They've been told that hope lies within these walls. When they show up, they either get treated like dirt or just indifferent to them. We just kind of ignore them. There's no care, there's no compassion. Or just maybe they're completely ignored. In one place that I, I read, it says they ignore them and then go back to their holy huddles, which I thought was hmm. so poignant. This poor woman was truly at the end of her rope. She had nothing left to try, nowhere else to go, but she had nothing else to lose. She felt that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would find hope and healing. Just the fringe of his garment, which had probably been gone through dirt and mud and dung and everything else that's on those streets. But she just felt if she could just touch it. She wasn't caught up in the hype. She was after hope. We here at Blue Mountain, we're a ministry of hope. You can tell that there's no hype here. Okay, we don't have flashy lights. We don't even have our own building. Okay? <laughs> During the spring and summertime, we're out in the amphitheater. And that's okay with us. Yeah. <laughs> because it's not about the hype. It's not about the flashy building. It's not about having your lyrics on the screen. It's not about having the newest, latest, greatest instruments or equipment or whatever the case may be. Yeah. We're a ministry of hope and love. You see, all of our hope is in Jesus, just like the song tells us. And the miraculous things that he can and will do. Much like Peter and Andrew in Matthew 4, we have made the choice to seek hope by following Jesus. He makes our ordinary extraordinary. There are too many out there in other churches that believe you have to yell, shout, or even demean or guilt people into having an emotional response to the experience of church. Hype man, if you will. I believe we're living in a time where acceptance plays a big, okay, a huge part in our society. Everyone's looking for an excuse to do what they want to do. People want to get the green light to act according to their own will and in their own way. I've read where someone stated, we are living in an anything goes, just let it flow society. We want what we want so bad that we'll do just about anything humanly possible and listen to just about anybody to get it. I'm not saying people in here, I'm just saying this is, many are out there preaching an agenda of political or even social agendas. That's where we get caught up in the half-truths, misinformation, and mis misinterpretation of the gospel. This miracle of the woman of the issue of blood is the pinnacle 
of our vision of hope over hype. In the crowd, we can see all of the hype, the emotion, the fervor, just to be able to get close to this man they call Christ, this Son of God. I'm sure they're shouting, there's frenzied activity, all to be a part of this spectacle. Because I'm sure that's what it was. It was probably a spectacle. But this woman, she saw the hope that lives in Jesus. He was her last hope. He was right there. She assumed a position of submission. She would, you know, I, I've read places where it says she crawled through the crowd just to get to the point of being able to touch his garment. And what did she find? She found a savior. She found healing. She found faith. She found peace. Mm -hmm. And all this she found in one man and one man alone. Our Savior Jesus. It's really funny. My, my, my boss sent me and all the rest of us in her division this poem by a woman named Nikki Bannis, and I want to read it to you. Title is Hope. If you only carry one thing throughout your entire life, let it be hope. Let it be hope that better things are always ahead. Let it be hope that you can get through even the toughest of times. Let it be hope that you're stronger than any challenge that comes your way. Let it be the hope you are exactly where you're meant to be right now, and that you're on the path to where you're meant to be. Because during these times, hope will be the very thing that carries you through. The one place you can find hope is in Christ Jesus. Does your soul need a healing? Push through the crowd. Push through those medical conditions. Push through your family or your relationship problems. Push through to your Savior. Find your hope in Jesus. He will be your constant hope over the hype all day, every day. There's nothing He can't do. There's nothing He won't do for those that love and revere Him. We see in this woman, and I know of my personally, my, my personal life, I felt like this woman at some point. Felt just just a wreck. Just felt like there was no nothing. There was nothing positive, nothing good that was coming of my life or coming from my life. I knew nowhere else to turn. We got involved in a couple of ministries, and there was a lot of hype. There was a lot of hype. There was a lot of shouting. There was a lot of lights. It was great. It was a great, it was great entertainment. But the relationship, the hope that lies in the words of this book, the hope that lies in just touching and pushing through and pushing through the crowds to touch his garment, the dirty fringe of his garment is all that a simple sinner needs become whole, to become healthy, to become faithful, and to find peace. That's all. It's that simple. It's hope over hype every day, all day. Because the hype is only going to keep you up for a minute. It's only going to last for a time. But hope, oh my friends, hope is eternal. Hope is something that you can't take it away from me. Because I've seen I've tasted the sweetness of His mercy. I've seen Him show up in ways that I never thought possible. I've seen Him restore relationships that I definitely never thought possible. I've seen Him save the hardest of people. All because of hope. You can't take my experience from me. But I challenge you to find your own experience of hope. I challenge you to find your own time in the Lord to be able to commune with Him, to commune with your Savior, to talk to Him, to find the hope that lies in every word spoken to Him because it does not come back void. If you're giving yourself honestly and reverently and openly to Him in all things and in all ways, He will return. 
those things that you ask with even greater reward. I'm not saying he's going to drop a sack of money in your lap. What I am telling you is he's going to give you a peace. He's going to open doors. He's going to change hearts and minds. Why? Because you're his beloved. You're the one he's seeking after. You're the one he wants. You're the one he, you are his bride. He, he's the bridegroom. You're his, his betrothed. You're his beloved. And he is the one, just like we do in marriage, watches after the other. And he will do that for you. I challenge you this week. Be the source of hope for somebody. Just one person. One person. I feel like I missed my opportunity this morning. But I told him, I said, I will be back. I, I, told, I told him, I said, I'm going to call you so we need to catch up. He said, okay, yeah, that'd be great. I'll get you. I'll get there. But don't let the opportunity pass by. Don't let the opportunity to be the hope over the hype every day. There's somebody out there, somebody at work, somebody at the store, somebody at school, somebody on a phone call or by text. However you can reach them, give them something to hope for. Let them know they're loved. Let them know that there's something greater than just being stuck in the same old quagmire day after day. Let's go ahead and pray.